more ready. This is the brick when it's not wet. It looks like a brick, but it's actually hollow. And it can get submerged in water and then you release it and water comes out. And you can water things with that water. Totally. And you can also do like collective somatic things with it. I've got all my weird objects. I've got a tongue. Girl. Too much talking. I don't know what to do with that tongue. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got some rocks that I made. Oh, the rocks are fun. Yeah, I've got a lot of things just for, you know, it doesn't only have to be chatting, not only verbal. Verbosity. Oh, okay. So here's the chat situation. We've got chatting in the chat. Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hello. I'm going to say hi, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's now noon, so I feel like I can start the thing. Yep. Okay, let's do the thing. So, Carolyn Woolard, CW. Hello. Hey, pal. It's your hey. friend, Kenneth Bailey. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm also here with Alternative Art School. I'm repping, um, and we're going to do a little interview. Nice. We're going to talk about what's going on in your life. We're going to talk <laughs> about your art. We want to hear your take on the political situation. And, you know, see where things go. Beautiful. But, but first, I, I, I really would love for people to hear about your practice as an artist. What kind of work are you doing? What are you interested in? And the like. So sure. let me know. What, what are you doing? Yeah, so I am based on the East Coast. Sometimes I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. Sometimes I'm in Brooklyn, New York. I go all the way from Philly to Vermont, as you know, often. <laughs> and I think in my work, my main concerns are how to create more collective power for artists and what the role of sculptural objects can be in collective practice. So sometimes I say I wear four hats. Um, one hat is being an artist, making objects, making media, the visual, the sensual. Another hat is being a cultural equity advocate. So that means making sure that resources are distributed equally and to redistribute resources that have historically not gotten to a lot of us. Um, I'm also a researcher. I do a lot of research. We can talk about that. I think we share that research love. And I'd say I'm a solidarity art world builder, meaning I'm really interested in artist run institutions, collective institutions, and building the art worlds that we want. So I've done everything from help to start barter networks for artists, designers, and craftspeople to peer to peer learning platforms this thing called trade school that I can type in here, uh, to thinking about local currency. Like what if we didn't have a national money, national legal tender? We had local currency that communities used instead. And uh, also founding a kind of arts think tank, BFA, MFA, PhD, dot com, if you want to look at it. <laughs> I'm going to put this in chat. Uh, you're, really, you're really lazy. Yeah, I love to do things. <laughs> I think I uh, love it when someone says, here's all this chaos. Let's try and channel it. What can we do with it? Yeah. Yeah, so that gives people a sense. Um, yeah. Should I say what I'm doing right now? I want you to show people what you're up to now, like what kinds of um, um, artwork, art thingies are you doing now? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, so in this world where I believe that as artists, we can both make objects and make bigger systems, like we can create the institutions that we want, I'm doing both of those things. So I'm like making really weird objects, like this is a rock. It looks like a rock. It's actually made out of ceramic. This crazy rock <laughs> that you can put in water and it'll release water. So it's like an object that you use in a collective experience, 
it's something that I mail to people or that they can check out of the Free Library of Philadelphia coming soon in 2021. Uh, it's in the permanent collection of the Philly Free Library. Um, and you can use this in groups to get more grounded, to be aware of the tactile senses that are often overlooked in only verbal or only mediated conversations like this, where it's so language based. And at the same time, in terms of building the institutions we want, I'm using objects like these to have conversations with a number of people. A new one that I didn't even tell you about yet, Kenny, is I got a successful uh, opportunity. I answered a request for proposals to guide philanthropists nationally to think about how they can support solidarity art worlds, worker-owned artists, cooperatives, artist-led land trusts. So it's with Eddie Torres and Nati from the New Economy Coalition. And basically we are going to write this huge report to advise these major funders like Bloomberg, Ford, uh, the Barr Foundation about what it would mean to truly support artist co-ops, artist run institutions from the very basic, like they're not going to be a 501c3 to the really radical, like where did your money come from in the first place? You know, distribute it or invest in slow and patient capital for co-ops. I can put a little link to that. The other thing I'm doing that's related to my institution building love is here. Let me put this here. Oh yeah, I didn't even say, these rocks are now on view in New York City at Miriam Gallery, which is an artist-run space um, that Ying just put a link to. So that's, the link I just dropped in is about uh, the other thing I'm doing, which is how do we make business models for cooperatively run art schools? And I got this money from CCI, this really awesome organization that you should all look at, uh, focused on so-called new economies, our solidarity art economies. And they're giving me money to meet with a bunch of business people to come up with an open source directory of business models for future alternative art schools, like this one that we're in right now. So that's gonna be really fun. So I'm like making the objects, but then I'm also thinking about the infrastructure. How can we actually have art institutions that reflect values of cooperation, you know, worker dignity, things that I think you and I care about and talk about a lot. So that's really fun. And it's a lot. It's a big responsibility. Why why do you think the this sort of desire or this discussion around alternative art schools, alternative art um, institutions is up and at them right now? Like what 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 what's the impetus for this um, sort of moment we're in with alternatives? Sure. Yeah, I think um, I don't know if you saw the Coco Fusco writing in Hyperallergic today. I've been, I've been forwarding it like crazy. Yeah. I'm gonna talk. Yeah. About, I'm gonna talk about it with Kimmy later today. Oh, beautiful! So everyone should look at this. I can try and drop in the link, but basically. What Coco Fusco is saying that I think is so true and so smart. We need new institutions rather than, you know, another artwork kind of token from a marginalized, in her case, what she's talking about is being Latinx or black artists making a new artwork or selling something in a gala. Instead, she's like, we need to make the institutions that will support artists for the long run. So anyway, I'm thinking of that because, of course, every time the economy crashes, Like, we can see it every decade or less. People are all of a sudden like, oh, wait, that didn't work for me either. So once it gets to a broad enough group of people that everyone can see how the economy is failing, like when we have this level of unemployment, similar to the 2007-2008 crisis, people are like, there must be another way. We need to think of another way to... Um, work together. But of course, for those of us who these systems never supported fully, we've always been doing this work and we've always been creating institutions that work for us. So my fear is that all of these schools that are coming up right now, including this one that we're talking in, 
um, if they don't have proper business models and aren't supporting artists in the way we really need to see, they will either reproduce the same problems of inequity that we already see in the older traditional institutions, or they will close. So like, what would it mean to have dark study not close? You know, what would be a model that's actually sustainable to allow it to not close? Um, that's what I'm really turning my gears on every day. Because I saw it in 2007, 2008, we had all these schools, we had a convening of schools, and um, they're all closed now. Wow. So we don't want to do that again. And Dark Studies um, art focused as well? Yeah, I can put a little link in there. Um, and a lot of these, you know, it seems like they're funded in one of three ways. Either it's philanthropy, which is unreliable, as we can see, it's based on whatever whims of the funder, or they're based on student tuition, which is not the best because only some students can afford it, and it might give them so much debt that they can't practice in the arts anyway, or it's volunteer run, and that kind of volunteer effort leads to a lot of burnout and is hard to sustain when people have to work other jobs. So, you know, to my mind, the best way to do it is an international consortium like, you know, is happening here in the Alternative Arts School. Um, but ideally, a multi-stakeholder co-op so that the workers and the teachers are balancing the wages with the tuition of the students and the mentees. And uh, we share the profits together. Yeah. Oh, and also it should be subsidized from schools in places where there's actually social democracy, you know, care for public goods like health care, art, education, where artists are actually paid to make art. So what if this was the New York headquarter, and then we also have headquarters in awesome. Oslo? Exactly, where you could actually be paid to make art. You could have a 10-year stipend where demand is created by the public, you know, where taxation actually allows people to be artists rather than always assuming there has to be a market through the individual, which, you wow. know, is not very equitable. So that's what we're scheming up. Every every week I get to convene people with my friend Dan Tae Young, and we talk about what are we going to do? How are we going to fund these things? And soon, this very school that we're talking in right now, NATO, watch out. We're coming to interview you soon. This is my friend Dan who's working on it with me. Awesome. I oh, met Dan last week, right? That was Dan. Yep. Got it. Okay, okay, okay. So you're in the scheme, the dream team. Here's the new economy coalition uh, for people who are not aware of that. Who's running that now? Oh, I don't even know. I know that Eli. It's here. It's here in Boston. It's many places. So basically, the New Economy Coalition finally became a real coalition, and they're actually oh, moving forward in direction. Okay. And now it really is uh, member driven with very few people on staff. Oh, and I didn't know that. So Eli is one of the main people that's been around for a long time. Wow, well, I know Eli from up here. Okay, yeah. So it's Natty who I'm working with who runs the media strategy right here. Um, yeah, so she, you know, has worked with especially musicians and performing artists all over the world to try and get more pay for performing artists for a long time with a focus on the solidarity economy. And I think it's a good balance because I'm more focused on visual art and less in the organizer world that she's in. So I'm bringing like the research academic, like, oh, you know, yeah. I know how to pass as a white philanthropist and she's bringing the organizing and music world and co-op musician platform that she built. And we think that together we can convince some of these philanthropists, hopefully, to really make radical change. As you and I know, we've tried. We've been scheming about this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I want to shift to ask you a little bit about um, the next week the dreaded upcoming, whatever it's gonna be election here in the United States. I know we all aren't worried about that because the um, 
you know, PAS is an international platform, but those of us in the U.S. next week, it's going to be a busy. Um, how are you making sense of it? Um, how is it? How are you thinking about it in relationship to your own work in all of your um, four spheres as an artist, as a new economy person, as an institution builder, um, as a mom? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe my join us at some point. Totally. Um, Oh, yeah, I know. What an awful week. I think we've all been uh, sort of energetically and somatically gearing up for this, obviously, with the recent uprisings and the recent killing of William Wallace Jr. You know, it's just our country is clearly at this flashpoint. And sure, I think uh, we have to vote, of course, like my chosen family. I've been bugging for a long time. And now finally forcing some of them to vote who are against, you know, they're like, why would we do this? And I'm like, come on, people, you know, we cannot have Trump. But obviously the Biden-Harris party, it's not, that's not our solution. You know, it's like, this is so centrist. This is so conservative. Like I was truly excited for AOC and Bernie Sanders. I was excited, but typically I don't place my energy in the space of electoral politics because I'm so committed to the direct democratic process, which is not reflected in our voter suppression, electoral college, racist history of uh, voting for these very few uh, choices that we have. So anyway, I think the real question is, what do we do either way the day after we hear the results, which could take a while, you know, yeah. weeks, um, and I think that's the work that I'm really excited to participate in. Like, okay, so we know we're gonna have white supremacists on the one side and progressives and lefties, people participating in uprisings on the other side. And how do we keep our communities safe on the one hand and also use this regardless of the outcome, honestly, uh, to keep building this movement for racial justice and for economic justice. How can we think more structurally, like you and I like to talk about, which I want to ask you questions about too. Um, yeah, how can we not just uh, feel like there was a win or a loss and not only be in a space of defense against like real violence in the streets? How can we use this as a moment to radically restructure the way that we work, especially as artists, but as all precarious workers, whether we're teachers, you know, essential workers, um, organizers. I think that's what excites me so much about what you do. You know, I think I'd love to hear this from you. What are you doing? Well, you know, we're still going to be running social emergency response centers. I have to talk to you about that some more too. I know we have a couple of conversations we have to have about that, but yeah, surf the world. Um, we'll be running a surf that next day, um, um, and a few more days after that. But then my gut is, is we're going to have to even increase the amount of of um, resource that we put into that. And I think for us, what we're really trying to figure out is how do we stick to our guns around imagining a new world um, when the world that we're, the way we're running them right now, Zeph, is that um, they're all online. So if you wanted to gather um, a bunch of people in the Bay Area to come and jump online with us, we would um, totally be into that. Or we could um, connect with you to organize um, one um, with Bay Area people and use our platform. So that's how it, it works. We we, um, we have it structured that it could... Um, I just put in a link to it. For oh, thanks. We have it structured so that people can self-organize and use some of the resources we have taped there, or you can come and join us on Wednesdays when we're live. Um, but, um, yeah, like the world is going to make us want to, it's going to, the energy, the gravity is going to suck us into um, wanting to sort of fight the misery of the world that is. And um, 
how do we continue to imagine and, and propose the world we want with this kind of energy? And I'm wondering how you're thinking about that in your own practice, like how, like, you know, will, will, will um, holding out and pointing out feel um, wrong in the midst of what we probably will see as, you know, horizontal violence in the streets? Totally. Yeah, I think um, being in groups like the CERC groups that you're forming, the Social Emergency Response Center groups, and being in collectives that I'm in where we have built relationships so that we can actually protect each other and grieve together and hold the real loss and fear and anxiety of moments like this and also know that there's a bigger project that we all are participating in is one of the most um, helpful things. So I think how you're building communities of practitioners and learners, researchers who can be reflecting, you know, from 10,000 feet, what's happening while also making it through the day, you know, finding that balance. And I think a lot of that has to do with relationships with people like you and me that we can also actually just take care of each other like i need to find a place to live okay let's figure it out and then also like hey let's make the social emergency response center international how do we do that so i think it's um opening up more opportunities for people to be in critical introspection and collective reflection where they truly build caring relationships and allow that space for a strategy. So it's not only reactive, you know, because of course the energy will be aggressive. The energy will be filled with grief, um, potentially, but most likely. So let's prepare for it together and uh, hold each other through that, do the work that we need to do, but not only be in this temporality of like now and now and now and now, reaction, 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 reaction. Having relationships with people like you allows me to breathe for a moment and be like, okay, what is the bigger picture? We have to make time and give each other time, not condemn each other for taking time also to dream and to build with each other on a much bigger scale and a longer time frame than most things allow, including schools, you know? Yeah. And what role do you see for artists in that dreaming, in that in that proposing? Yeah, of course. I think the reason um, I think I convinced you that you're an artist, right? Did I? <laughs> I'm coming around. I'm coming around. Tiago, <laughs> who I'm, I'm co-teaching um, um, this course with inside of. Um, um, the alternative art school is in capital A artist. So there you go. You won't be, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When I see anyway. it, I'm like, I I I think artsy like. You're an artist. So anyway, we have to deal with that term. We can call ourselves creatives or designers or producers, imagineers, innovators, whatever you want to call yourself. Um yeah, what I think is that people who are drawn to making, either with their hands, you know, visual makers or with code or whether they do it with performance, basically we are people who from a very early age decided that we would not accept traditional forms of knowledge that were given to us by a very colonial, racist, heteronormative world. So from the beginning, we were put in some horrible school institution, most likely, where we had to sit down and deal with written and verbal English. And we said from the beginning, if we were called into this world of creativity with art and design and technology, absolutely not. You know, I know in my body, in my soul, that there's another way to be. I know that there's a way to, as your friend said, heal the life worlds uh, that is about embodied knowledge. It's about, you know, being able to make this crazy brick, being like, what if a brick could rain water? It's about uh, moving and knowing that when you move and dance, there's another form of communication that's happening. 
And despite everyone around you telling you that that is not valuable or legitimate or the most important thing to do, we did it anyway. And so I think because of that, we at some point get radicalized and we realize like, why isn't this valued? You know, why can't I make a living in this, in this country at least? And so at that point, I hope most of us realize that we're connected to all the other people working on social goods like healthcare, education, all of these things that are necessary that build community, that help us communicate without words, that are knowledges that have been suppressed. And we realize that we have to work in solidarity with each other on a bigger scale. So that's a long-winded way of saying like, we are the people who bring tactility to the revolution. Like we bring crazy stuff. Tactility. Like, like the weird thing. Like I have a gigantic tongue. You know, I bring this to my Zoom meeting. I bring this crazy. I brought you a show and tell thing because I love you. I bring this. I love you too. <laughs> you know, I mail people bricks. And then I make them use them with buckets of water so they can't touch their computers during a Zoom call. You know, we bring this stuff that that other people are not going to bring. Like we bring the vision. We bring also an ability to listen and not emphasize language. You know, a silence. We bring all the things that you bring. You know, the design studio, all of that. What would we do if we didn't have images or sounds or dance? in the uprising, in the revolution. You know, obviously we're central. It's no coincidence that many of the leaders of social movements are artists. It's just that art gets relegated to a very institutional space, a very elite space that reproduces a ruling class aesthetic and ideology, but it doesn't have to be that way. And maybe that's why you don't want to be called an artist. Is that why? Perhaps, I, I, I think sometimes it, it's because when I think about um, my my thinking about what artists are, or is that they produce the things that you produce. And if I produce the things that you produce concretely in a regular way, maybe I would then consider myself an artist. Mm -hmm. I mostly work in text and ideas. And I feel more like a designer. Mm. You know, I always thought I'm secretly a designer, but I don't use that word because they don't get residencies or fellowships. <laughs> yeah yeah and i always wanted to make this thing that's like called the style guide for conceptual art because designers understand style guides they're like these documents for the artists in the room who don't get it style guides are like these documents that tell you how to deal with a logo like what font to use what color the spacing and so i thought i should make this for designers because so many designers are secretly artists, but they don't know the style guide. Like they need to, for example, not use the word user. They need to say participant, audience member. They need to put more white space around things. They need to not over stylize their photography because their documentation tends to be very styled. Um, all these things, they could just look at the history of Dada and Fluxus and the avant-garde and then you know, have fun choices that are related to that. And they can sort of swoop in because often designers are more humble and more open to process than uh, some artists that I've met. So oh I think you would get in. I need, I need that um, style oh, guide God. <laughs> um, for the workbook. Let's do okay. it. I want, I want the, the, I have to write a, a workbook for this book that um, we recently wrote, How Ideas of Reading Its Effects. And I want it to, I want to play with the the fluxus. I want to play with art, art, art aesthetic. Yeah, let's do it. To play with it. Just put a photo with so much white space around it. Oh yeah. I want and all, use courier typewriter fonts. You know, some adaptation, modernist version of that. I want it. I want it. I want the distant, austere look. <laughs> well, you know, people hate designers. Like someone here said, design happens when soul is taken out of art. So you also have to convince people that just as there's artists who are working for the market, there's, of course, so many designers working for the market. Like you might need to explain more about what you mean when you say designer. Because a lot of people hate designers in the art well, world. I don't blame them. But tell me, like, what is designer to you? 
Um, it's it's just the it's just a set of um, concerns and techniques about worlding, about um, uh, a way into imagining socialities that are just and sustainable. Um, you know, but I understand when people say they hate design, what they mean, like they they see the people who are making the iPad or are making, you know, like it's like they see it. Um, uh, yeah, and I think the problem that um, we like to orient um, to solving are are the problems of justice and civil society um, versus the problems of capital. Um, and um, and and um, art at times fetishizes useful. Yes. It does. <laughs> But I do think, you know, a lot of what I'm interested in that intersection between um, um, the way design moves in the world and the way art moves in the world. So much of our process is about bringing what I often refer to as aesthetic ways of knowing and that sort of rancière distribution of the sensible, yeah. all of that stuff into relationship with nonlinearity and systems dynamics and into relationship with power and politics um and a, as a, a strategy for imagining ways of being together that are more convivial and just totally. but, um, so yeah um um Vahap wants to know what what's bad about fetishizing uselessness um you should read a friend of mine named aaron manning recently wrote a book um on the useless. I I would see if I can find it. Um uh, Aaron Manning um useless. The other thing I would say as we're like looking well, at pragmatics it, of the useless. Pragmatics of the useless. I'm gonna put the link in the um in the chat. For you folk who are interested, yes, that's my homie. I'm down with Aaron and Brian. Those are my peeps, Dan. I'm just gonna paste in also. I don't know. There might be like a word count. No, there's not. I'm gonna paste in an intense paragraph that I wrote about why I would want to teach graphic design. It's really long. Oh my God! What? Uh, this was like me trying to get a design job. I was a finalist, but anyway. What I said that I think is important is like, uh, you need to have disciplinary awareness of design. So I said in the same way that art cannot simply be understood as useless, experimental, and autonomous, design cannot simply be understood as useful, client-driven, and contextual. Just as every designer will benefit from the visual arts disciplinary emphasis on self-directed inquiry, ambiguity, and materiality, Every visual artist will benefit from design's disciplinary emphasis on audience, clarity, and the distribution of ideas. Picabi and Delaney, all these people, all of them, redefined art by creating the graphic identities and printed matter of major artistic movements. You know, you can't think of Dada without the blind man, surrealism without the Declaration of Independence of Imagination, da 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 fluxes all the way to black women artists for Black Lives Matter without the manifesto and graphic identity. You know, so we need to be more clear about the collaboration between yes. designers or whatever you want to call them, good communicators yep. and radical art practices. Exactly. You know, these are the distribution people. Yep. So I love working with designers or calling myself a designer when it's tactical. <laughs> and um, uh, I've been trying to figure out how to how to get on the art residency um, boat as well. Take my style guide. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a question about um, institutions and the institutions we need. So, um, what kind of sort of jumping off of Fusco's um, uh, um, critique, if, if what kind of institution would you like to see? Can, do you have any common image of an institution that would, um, in terms of the arts that would make you happy? 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, like the conversations we were having, thinking about business models, it's sort of like, um, what scale of institution do you want to talk about? And that's why I'm so into an international institution, because we can draw upon resources of countries that actually subsidize social goods. So I'm going to say things about institutions I want in the U.S. with the caveat that we do not support public goods like education, art, and healthcare, which means that the institutions are somewhat limited in their capacity. And often things become interpersonal decisions that would just be structural policies in other countries. Like, I am going to choose to cooperate, or I'm going to choose to give away my money, or I'm going to choose to work my ass off to run an equitable art space, rather than you will because this is the structure that is given to us at a larger scale. So anyway, things that really excite me right now are, for example, Anyeta Kachuke's new gallery, Storage. You know this? Mm-mm. Okay, let me put it in there. So Anyeta and I went to school together at Cooper, which Cooper Union was free for everybody for 154 years. And I think that really shaped the way that we operate in the world. So anyway, Anyeta just opened this gallery and he calls it a gallery as a form of protest in New York City. And it's showing an amazing range of artists. Like if you look at the list, there's Emery Douglas, Leslie Hewitt, you know, Rick Lowe. It's an amazing group. And what's exciting to me about this is even though it takes a conventional frame of the gallery, the idea is to look at the whole life of the artist, like from housing to legal support and make sure that they get support from this wider network. So that sounds like a very boring institution. Um, but Anyetica was like, I can intervene in the gallery system. Um, other ones that really excite me, like if I were to see institutions that I want, I would honestly let a lot of institutions crash and burn, redistribute the resources, and make things like a cooperative art school, make things like a media and software company where the people who participate in it use that software and then train people to use it. So right now, a lot of software companies don't do training or take venture capital and then operate in a way that's very creepy and controls our behaviors like Instagram or Facebook. And so what would it mean to have an artist and designer co-op creating software for like 3D Zoom? You know, like, let's imagine that you and I are now meeting in some space that's more tactile. It has scent. It has the ability for you to feel the texture of this. And what if we as artists and technologists build that 3D Zoom, and then we use the proceeds to create some kind of art school or distribution mechanism for artwork. And then we have surplus and we can keep training people. I think there's a lot of opportunities right now for um, digitally oriented immersive experience that could be run by artists and designers and that would have an emphasis on people who have been marginalized historically and not let into a lot of elite cultural circuits like, you know, BIPOC artists, queer artists, disabled artists, etc. Um, yeah, I could keep listing them. Maybe that's too abstract, but there are a lot of things that I think uh, would be in my future institutions. What about your yeah. future institutions? I think um, I'd love to see um, I'd love to see something that looked like you know Europe's um, re-institutionalizing um, yeah. of the Bauhaus in the United okay. States specifically, or, you know, in this hemisphere, specifically around tackling the the, the, the double whammy of climate and um, um, sort of the end of capitalism. You know what I mean? Like capitalism is burning out, the climate's burning, like we're reaching this limit, you know, sort of looking at like donut economics and all of these sort of things and saying, how do we redesign our worlds um, given these realities you know but like some large some large institutions that are legitimately aimed at doing that with lots of resources 
So do you think that's going to happen with this new Bauhaus? I like, don't. Tell, tell me about your excitement for this Bauhaus. Or this is like an alternative Bauhaus. This is like an alternative Bauhaus. Because I'm like, what? isn't the Bauhaus so Eurocentric, colonial, like individuating? I don't know. I like the, I think I just like the, the fact that it's going to be Europe-centric, like a yeah. big, like the um, EU is going to take it on. And they're looking at thinking about the role of design in making Europe better. Um, you know me, I would want to take big, um, state sponsored, but then turn it on its head and have it be focused on the hemisphere and climate and, well, she can't get in though. Um, you know, public life. <laughs> but, but I like the idea that something big, like, you know, several nation states are looking to this process of design to make its life better. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, it could all start with spaces of reflection and transformation like schools, but it can also be yeah, at every level. It should be, if we're thinking about new institutions in general, they need to be more collectively run, I would say, because otherwise it'll reflect the bias of the person running it and reproduce a sense of rank and inferiority for the people working under the person in charge and therefore will be very limited in its capacity. But yeah, I started brainstorming this whole list of future institutions. Maybe I should just like say a few of them. Yeah, we'd love that. I'm going to grab my cord and plug it in because I think it. I'm running out while you start to list those. This stuff um, some institutions. I was just thinking about this morning. Like, I don't know if you all heard about this thing called Super Blue, which is like experiences for um, what typically would have been a gallery or museum. It's from Pace. It's this. So it's like, imagine, you know, you go to a James Trail or a Nick Cave uh, experience, but it's 40 bucks. It's ticket based now. So anyway, it's like Meow Wolf, but with like elite galleries backing it. So what if instead of that, yeah, exactly, Pace doing public art. What if instead of that, it's uh, experience based and immersive art school, but the students are producing the experiences and it's all the same things. Like there can be ticket sales. It can be subsidized by hopefully equitable real estate people. And I could imagine socially engaged artists being involved in this and actually benefiting from it if it were owned by the people producing those experiences. Because I'd like to know how much Nick Cave and Terrell is actually getting paid. You know, I don't know. We'd have to see how much people will pay for it. Um, another one is, I don't know if you know this thing, super rare. It's like a way to collect crypto art and they have things selling for a lot of money there. So what if there was that, except it was used to train the next generation of artists and designers and it was actually sharing in the surplus. Um, other things, what if there was a way to do an online bar or studio visit or happy hour that was uh, a way to connect people internationally to get to know each other with a kind of like spontaneity that is more possible in person than is happening online where people are reproducing the same social networks right now and not just the, the, the bar drinks well, it doesn't, I mean, maybe we have to mail them to you. You make your own. It's like a digital, imagine it like chat roulette, except chat roulette for creative people on Zoom. My friend Lika Volkova is really into this idea. Um, chat roulette is this old school thing, but imagine it's like we meet in 3D Zoom and I get to meet your best friend who I never would have known was your best friend until this chat roulette puts us in touch. It's like making room for spontaneous connections with people who you otherwise would be like sitting next to. Like this room for adjacency that you're really interested in. That kind of friction with the unknown and the awkwardness that doesn't happen as much through this like Zoom relationship uh, connectivity that we have right now. It's true. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard for chance encounters to happen in Zoom. Totally. Or like, I don't know if you know this thing, the Rockwood Leadership Institute. Yeah. Okay. So like that, but for artists, like, why don't we have a way for artists who are working in community to reflect on what they're doing and meet each other? 
So Rockwood is great because in order to get in, you have to ask three people who have worked with you deeply to give you really hard criticism that you don't receive until you're there. So why don't we have that for artists, you know, to hang out with each other and make time to think about what they did wrong look. so they can build something better in the future. Um, but yeah, in general, like my huge dream would be... Ariel's in. We don't have the term artist or designer anymore because we live in a huh? world where people have access to creativity as a human right. and It's not specialized and we are able to have livelihoods without jobs. <laughs> wow. We're very far away from that. And that's but it's, it's where we need to go. Okay, um, what what are your questions, Caroline? What are you? Thinking? So I want to know how you think IAE is going to go into effect the day after we find what? out the results from the election. What are your plans yeah. for that? I don't have any yet. Um, should we have some plans for how IAE should go into effect the day after the election? Like, what's CERC going to do? Oh, that's true. We are going to do a bunch of IE workshops. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Let me yeah. um, let me explain it. Yeah. I am going to throw it hand for a book we just wrote. Are you doing it or am I doing it? You explain it, but I'm putting the link in. Oh, okay. I is a shorthand for a book that we wrote at the design studio called Ideas, Arrangements, Effects. Um, it's a, a conceptual framework we developed that sort of captures our design methodologies. It says that um, ideas about the world are just abstract and floating in the sky. They exist in our physical and cultural and conceptual arrangements, like how we arrange um, our chairs and our and desk, like, how we arrange we this Zoom here, so class, how we arrange thing, material things, how we arrange the relationship between materials building, and culture. We're building equity um, into it. And, and those things produce kind of effects. DC Some of the effects are the bad things that we want to change, like climate, um, you know. But often, um, when we're trying to change the bad things, that are produced by those arrangements. We don't go up to the arrangements themselves. We just stay at the level of effect. And so the arrangements continue to produce the bad things. And so um, we wrote this book to try to help make the framework more understandable for other people and, and, and to try to invite more people into what yeah. we're saying is rearranging the world. We can arrange the world in ways that make it uh, more yeah. Um, teachers right now. Fun and just and yeah. interesting. Um, and some teachers. of that might look like imagining new arrangements, and some of that might look like we're intervening in the ones we already have. But before any of that happens, we have to actually understand that we are in arrangements and sense them and be able to recognize when we're being arranged. So that's a quick workshop on it. <laughs> And it's so helpful. I'd say what you know the way IAE has helped me is um, be really clear about that connection between the idea, the arrangement, and the effect. And because it's three things rather than other frameworks that I've used, which are like ten things, it's easy to get it in your head and then start structuring experiences and analysis through that framework. And yeah, I think if other people don't know, you should look at that book. Yeah, yeah, Billy Lee also teaches it. Yeah, a lot of us. Billy's teaching it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Okay, and then I would love to know. Maybe this is too like individuating, personal, art-like. But Thank I'd you. love to know how you got into this interest in prefigurative politics and world making in, you know, visionary fictions, whatever you want to call it, like believing that there can be a world that we could create together. How'd you get into that? Like what made you believe when everyone else is so cynical and like, it's impossible. I think I'm kind of a house hit. <laughs> Like I really exactly <laughs> it's your hypothetical too. Totally. <laughs> okay, say more. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, like the scene is a kind of prefigurative politics. Like, you know, you you go into this space, it's so yeah, it's like hyper 
it's you know, like I, I sort of grew up in a kind of I got cult, acculturated in an alterity called the housing, you know, where um, the the drag queen that's six foot five is slipping down to the ground next to you, and you're turning a flip, and there's somebody else next to you, something else doing something, and that was just to me kind of what the world should be. Um, that it should be like this sort of constant emerging bubbly um, surprising experience and um, and now you know um, these worlds where every where everything needs to be defined and exacted and clear and um, yeah I was just like I just wanted to create experiences that allow people to understand that the other ways that we can be with each other that don't that are more sort of in alignment with Buisson's idea of opacity and without that necessarily being um, um, disempowering um, but um, and fun, you know, that we can sort of be together and, and continue to co-emerge. So I was interested in like, how do you bring the kind of ethos of those kinds of spaces into other spaces that are more accessible accessible to other people so i think that's what really um makes me want to continue to make those kind of spaces is because i know what they do like, yeah you know can um, you play some of your favorite music now can we just do it for a second just like hear it i don't know if it's i don't know if people would hear it through um, your thing if you just play it on your computer um Present no, media. it's too complicated. Let's it not. Is. Present media. Start to click all. You can just play it. You know, like if I open up a YouTube thing and then I just play it, you'd hear. It. It's not as good. But let me see. I'll try. Me. I'll try here. There is a um, a mix that um, um, What's that? I've been killing. <laughs> okay. See, this is what I'm talking about. We should just do the thing rather than talking about the thing. Um, uh, house. Okay. For the future, put it in the the chat later, so we have, so we can think of you. Okay. Close this. I'm gonna come back here to where we are, and come back to close this. Put it in the chat. Uh, there. There's the link. Now I'm gonna play it and see if. Yeah, play it. Play it. But I, I don't know if it's gonna. If it's gonna. It's not playing in the actual. That's fine. We'll just hear it through your speakers. But I bet you there's a. There must be a way I can play it inside of. Oh, I'm sure there is. Present media or something, but I don't know how to do that. Let me see. I'm gonna. I'm gonna see if I can sort or. How oh, yeah, but I mean, we're not paying them that much. Yeah, right here. $4,500 uh, to get this campus? I, I mean, you know how many payments of $4,500? Wait, can I just say? Like $15 million. I'm such a, um... They gotta I'm, so I'm just going to do it. How did you do that? I'm just playing it off my computer. Yes, yeah, tell us what do you do? <laughs> yes, he does. I'll remind you. Stay here as long as you want. What do you want? <laughs> I think we should, um, Keep talking. Play, play, two more minutes, play two more minutes and open it up to questions. All right. All right. I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, I don't. Um, I'm looking here. I guess if you have a question um, or you want to ask a question, say in live chat. 
and I will make you a co-host so you can come and ask it um, in real time. I'm curious to hear more from Kenneth about how you see work happening in public interest design field. Um, I'm going to try to make you a co-host so we can see your, um, that's not working. It keeps, you have to uncohost Caroline. Oh, okay. So I need to go and uncohost you. And now I can make um, Zeph co-host. Um, maybe if I go here to people and go down to Zeph. There. There. Got it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, NATO. So now you can ask your question with your face up. Okay, with my face. Um, when, you were, when you were talking earlier about, you know, uh, we were talking about institutions, and you were sort of imagining an institution uh, in the in the U.S. that would do interesting work for you. And I was wondering, I was wondering if, if there's, you know, in the field of public interest design, seems like closely related to what you do. Um, so I'm wondering if that's a place where you look for models and inspiration, or where you where you where you find your inspiration in the work that you're doing. Um, not really. Mostly, it's like most of my information, my, my information, my inspiration really comes from like a lot of the intervention that's happening out in South America. Um, it's mostly from the interventions I see in Brazil and in Colombia. I feel like a lot of the stuff that's happening in the United States around the more uh, official mainstream stuff, like public interest design, is still a little too liberal. It's right. not. It's not. It's not kooky and interesting enough. Um, so when you say interventions, do you, like coming from grassroots people who are doing it on the grassroots level, and and stuff that's I would just say that stuff that's more aesthetically um, interesting. That's what Caroline would call me an artist. She would say like, okay. "Are you talking about art?" <laughs> right. But, like I'm really interested in like um, like I find inspiration in a, a friend of Tiago and mine's. This guy, um, Claudio Prado. Um, he uh, one of the inter he's going to come and talk in our class at some point, but he does this intervention called um, uh, um, Couch on the Street, and it would happen at like midnight and go to five in the morning, where he put his whole living room out on the street and then let activity spontaneously emerge. I um, mean, for him, it's because life should be free, um, and so he would do this sort of in in response to nightlife that costs money. And he was like, we should be able to produce our own public nightlife. And I'm way more interested in that um, as a kind of design proposition than I am, you know, let's make um, nicer, um, whatever the stuff that people care about in public interest design. Right. I, like the, I like the stuff that has more, I don't know what you call it. Um, it's more, I think, aesthetically interesting. Uh -huh. But that's the only way I know to answer it yeah i would love to ask you more about that but i also want to leave space for the people to ask questions so Zeph, you. You hang out. we can we can you can ask me more all the time okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um uh for more house music for y'all all later i love marcus wyatt i'm a total head i love that guy um nato has a question should we cool. let nato jump in yeah i'll stop co-hosting thank you Oh, here. Hi, Nato. Hey, Kenneth. And hi, Caroline. And thank you for the amazing talk. I love both of you so much. And I think it was 16 Beaver when they were in Documenta had this project called And, 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 And. And I want to kind of start on that note. I'm a big believer in the and. And I was thinking about like all these alternative proposals and cooperative models and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, at this moment when COVID hit and everything slowed down, I was like, what the fuck's going on? And I felt like it was like, unleashed the alternative models that we art activists have been developing for 20 years. And it felt like I had a moment where I was like, I just feel like there's an urgency to get stuff done and all these alternative models are not clicking. 
And I say that because I kind of feel like while I agree with Caroline's, we certainly differ on some things. And I kind of feel like um, with this school, it is not a cooperative model. It's more based on like the DC hardcore model, something like um, Discord Records. And I do believe in tuition because I believe rather than waiting for a grant or philanthropist, cash collectively pooled can get things done. And this thing's up and running and we're paying teachers good rates and we're building equity in the program. But I'm kind of like waiting to see other models that kind of actually can work. And I think like to go to utility and like strategy, I want to talk about that because I feel like I'm all for the proposals and I'm all about it. But I think we all agree. We're looking for things that can have some uh, capacity and some viability and can have some traction in a world of art activism that quite frankly, at times, I feel like there are a long list of things that are really good in spirit that just aren't working. And, and, and at some point that, you know, what's the, what's the sign of madness banging against your, your head against the wall too many times and it doesn't work, you know, I'm looking for things that work. So I wanted to kind of ask about that in terms of the merit, the metrics of efficacy and, you know, um, thinking about other pools of resources that you've seen rather than just cooperative models, but alternative economic models that generate uh, resources to build themselves. And that's to, um, I mean, Kenny, maybe you could have Caroline kind of jump in too, or you both kind of reflect on that. I'm going to turn it back to Caroline. Cool, cool. That would be a Caroline question. Take it, CW. You got to unmute yourself too. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Let me see. Okay, yeah, I'm back. Um, yeah, absolutely, NATO. There's no way I would be present here with such enthusiasm and uh, send you people to be in this school yeah. if I didn't believe in it. Yeah. I think, um, of course, a cooperative is just one model. It's just yeah. a structure for governance. And um, there's no reason that, for example, uh, existing non-cooperative models could become, couldn't yeah. become a cooperative. But yes, I'm here to get things done. I am a Capricorn. <laughs> I like to push for a pragmatic and feasible alternative, not just dream about it and have discussions and <laughs> hate on each other for years. I see a lot of um, infighting in the alternative art world spaces, which is ridiculous. Um, so that's why I kept talking about an international model. I think the most functional models that I've seen come when there's public subsidies that are available in other countries and not here. So for example, in Canada, in Winnipeg, there's an entire research center about new institutions, which is funded by the credit unions and cooperative sector in that region. So it's just um, obvious to them that institutions can connect to one another when they have shared values and share their surplus to help create more institutions. So I think a good model is to look to places where we can federate, we can be connected and share our surplus. On a non-governmental level, another example of that is Inspiral and Lumio. So that's a software um, group that all shares resources often pre-tax yeah. and also they share mentorship and advice. So here's Inspiral, inspired by them. And uh, imagine if all of all our alternatives supported one another in a consortium where we allowed a kind of think tank that Kenny could lead to create more of these. And yes, we need to stop um, trying to be a little bit better than the other one or a little more perfect. We need to just go. And I completely consent to other people's expertise and don't always want to be in a horizontal structure. To me, a co-op can also be something where employees have an option to vote, but they're not making decisions on everything, of course. Um, so yeah, I'd say Inspiral. And then here's an example of a research center that's funded by credit unions in Canada. Oh, that's awesome. But what else? Kenny, what do you think? How are we going to make these things work? I don't have a thought about it yet. Um, that's a come. I turned it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I agree. This is the time to like accelerate these models and not wait around to try and make it as like perfect as possible. That's why you know hats off to you, NATO, for making it happen. Here we are. I do, I We're do doing have it. A We're not talking about it. In terms of micro practice, 
Um, I think some of what you were just getting at, Caroline, um, requires that um, we not just be responsible for promoting our own thing, but we um, promote, we sort of collectively promote all ships. Um, and why do you think, what, what, what prevents that in the art world? Like, what is it about the art world that makes people want to just up their own boat and not try to float all ships like is there um what's your what's your take on it well, yeah i bet a lot of people will have things to say about this but this is like the deep and horrible like uh cold soul of the artist as the individual and i think it comes from the birth of uh the distinction between uh, artists with a capital A yeah. yep. and everyone else. So I think you can look at that identity being formed literally with the birth of capitalism, <laughs> which we could get into, like long well, history. Like off and on. You can look at the Raymond oh, Williams essay okay. about it, about yeah, the history of the term artist. Right but anyway, there's a very cold... Yeah, there's a Raymond Williams I love this essay you. about that I love to Yeah, let me put it in there. Uh, are you going to be? Also, he has a great in keywords, a great one about career, the history Dream. of that term. Anyway, um, so I think the reason artists do that is because a lot of it has to do with an education that's about my individual expression or, you know, my healing rather than uh, culture as collectively produced, inevitably, collectively uh, distributed, ideally, and like. We can each have oh. our own um, you look so good. It's message that we want to give. Artist, but if we were educated so to see that that good. comes what? from a long legacy yeah. of creating worlds, like you're talking about, Kenny, well, like then we would see that it has to be socialized. Like, like the only way for us to make a real so change in the imagination of people is to do it as a reverberating force that is shared among all people who have this identity as being creative, as like saying no to these other forms of knowledge. And unfortunately, most of us are educated to think about like my special object that is by me with my name. I know, it's a lot of And I think this is a moment where all the people who have hated on designers in the chat uh, should really think about the power of the identity of the designer because often your name is not even attached to the object or the experience that people are having like you have to look up who founded this software platform and that um sort of backseat identity to the experience or to the object that the designer has is one that i hope artists will have more of in the future. But I think nice. right now the schooling okay. is all about okay. me and myself and a fear that uh, that's the only way you can make a living. Yeah, that you just totally hit why I probably um, flinched from the art identity. It's because I'm not interested in me. I'm interested in the public kitchen or I'm interested in Cirque or I'm interested in IE. But I'm not interested in me, the person. And I hadn't put that together yet. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah, because it's like, this it can't just be like an interesting rock. It has to be like Caroline talking about rock. Sit, sit here, but, and honestly, that's why I like making online platforms and institutions online, because you don't see the person first. You have an experience. And hopefully no, these things, when they're in the public library, and so won't be experienced like, as art. D &D They'll be seen as Saturday like, oh, morning. I could check out a book, I like, or I could check out a rock. Did you talk to Trevor? But yeah, I do think it's a real issue. Should I? Real issue. Well, we should leave it for other, other questions. Totally. Let's get another one I think one you've in. got that. You didn't tell me this. What? What well, did I say about touching that? <laughs> I could tell Trevor. We've got um 20 more minutes, so we might as well take them. Huh? Whoa. You okay? Oh, we can wrap up if we don't have any more. <laughs> oh, no, 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 people have questions. Um, How is it to be a mama? Um, and then there's one on self-publishing art books. So I will um, put Caroline back on to talk about um, um, being a mama. And then I'll come back to you, Ben. Hello, 
Janine. I didn't know you were there. Wow. That means so much to me to be asked that question by you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Different, um, I feel a different temporality already just from that question and from you. Um, yeah, to be a parent, to give birth to a life that I think came through me, you know, it's not necessarily of me. It has really slowed me down and allowed me to be in touch with material in a different way. I don't know how to explain it other than, you know, I'm a Capricorn and I'm used to like making lists and talking fast. And when I'm in the life world of parenting and birth and social reproduction, um, I have to laugh at myself and be more present with the flow of life, with, uh, yeah, the realities of just, you know, holding someone else's vulnerability on such a infinite and uh, daily scale. And I don't know, maybe my baby will show up, but right now my partner's taking care of him. Um, yeah, it's such an honor to hold someone else's vulnerability on this level. I had no idea. And I feel so much solidarity with all the parents. I'm looking at you, Janine and NATO. It's crazy. Um, and also I have to say to anyone who was like, I would never want to be a parent. That was also me. I was like, why would you ever do that to someone else? Because I, you know, had my own traumas around being a kid. It was amazing. My par my partner convinced me to do it after like five years of me resisting. And I was like, why would anyone ever do that? And now I realize, yeah, it's about this um, getting healed. Getting healed by someone who is in the unavoidable present. You know, constantly in the now and in a very playful exploration of the now. And it's a beautiful way to transform yourself and literally give birth to a new version of yourself. I feel that when I gave birth, I like shat my Capricorn driver, anxiety driven planner self out. And now there's a new, you know, a new me that can be still really obsessed with feasibility and planning, but yeah, can also just not make an agenda and dance with house music. Like, I didn't have that before. So if anyone's terrified of being a parent, you should email me. I'll talk to you about it. And there's a lot of therapy and trauma, queer, somatic healing that I can recommend too to like get ready to push out a human. Push out a human. I'm gonna let Janine respond. Janine can respond. Janine, are you gonna respond? I put you on the co-host so you can respond to Caroline. I'm trying to. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, totally. Can you see me? Yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was so happy not to be on. Um, <laughs> that was just so beautiful. Um, thank you, Caroline. Uh, and I'm just really excited to watch you be a mom and continue to do all the amazing things you do and to see how it affects what you do. And I just wanted to, people to hear, um, I just feel like I've become a much better artist since I became a mom. So thank you. That's all. We want to go to Ben. Hey, hi Ben. Hi, thanks. Um, I just there's kind of a group of us here that has either self-published books already or is interested in self-publishing kind of art books, either you know as a collective, as a community, or as an individual. And I was just wondering uh, if Carolyn could talk a bit about 
um, you know, that process and how you can kind of use that to, um, like that. I don't know, reach a broader audience or kind of engage people socially and do Mom, it without like worrying say? too much about marketing huh? and more towards what's that time to say? Um, kind of as Sorry. a collective action, if that makes sense. I'm going to go back to, I'm going to take you off and go back to Caroline. I think these things go so well, don't you? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you, Ben, for that question. Um, I did just do this uh, workshop on that at Miriam. So I'm just going to put in a link for people in the future. You could watch this. It's like a 30-minute overview of the way that it works if you want to either self-publish or think about working with a publisher. Um, but I guess the quickest way I would put it is I have had major problems distributing self-published things. So when we're thinking about institutions, like Nato was saying, galleries, auction houses, we need a good distribution platform for small publishers, like who make experimental risograph zines and for self-published books. That really doesn't exist in the way that we need. It's not that easy to get your work immediately in a lot of spaces. So we need an online version of that. And we also need a bookstore, local, physical version of that. And um, I'd say that with the book that I just did with Onomatopoeia, that was a traditional publisher. And I just put a link to it there. Um, that was really helpful for me because they were able to distribute it widely. And it was really important to me that it show up in more mainstream spaces, like in order to get these ideas distributed. So anyway, I would watch that. Um, oh, and my little baby. Oh, I want to show you the baby. I'm sorry, this is a distraction, but yes. Oh. Baby. That's Kenny. Lion. Oh. <laughs> Jenny, oh, this is a little lion. Look at it. I just want to. <laughs> I just want to chew on it. Face. I want to chew on it. Anyway, that's the baby. I know we have a few more questions, but now you got to see. Look at this long baby. Only five months old. He's huge. He's in the 99th percentile. I love it. I'm going to go to Rachel. I'm going to stop posting you and, and let Rachel. Do it. Oh, Rachel. Yes, I remember Rachel. Let's see, Rachel. Rice shirt. I've never seen her face. Or oh, Rochelle. Is it Rochelle? Rochelle, uh, Rochelle Reichert. What? Why is it Ben? <laughs> ah! Ha, ha, ha. There you go, Rachel. Hi, okay, Rochelle. you can see me? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I have a question for Carolyn, actually. Um, I'm wondering, in my experience, when I'm working with arts institutions and arts programs and I'm looking for funding, I've partnered with a lot of um, private sectors, either venture capital or corporations or things like that. And it quickly becomes this thing where they're really excited. First of all, they're really excited about, like, your ideas and your creative freedom and um, kind of giving you funding to do a lot of exciting new things. And then um, shortly after, as time goes by, it becomes like this uh, situation where they want a product or they want like marketing or promotion, or it's more of what can, what deliverables artists can create for, for these, um, these companies. And I'm wondering, um, other than cooperatives, how it's possible to continue, because I know this exists, but how to, um, and maybe it's just a language thing, maybe it's, we have to frame it and the artist has to frame it in a specific way, but how to kind of continue that excitement and the enthusiasm and also convey the importance of having artists um, like cre creatively experimenting and um, and how that gives back to culture. Um, so I was wondering if there were any thoughts or ideas or um, more comments on that. Well, 
Well, okay, you are really the DJ right now. Here we go. Smash cut DJ. Okay, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Maybe I should like anyway, here we are. Um yeah, thank you for that question. I think the reason I'm interested in co-ops is about governance, not about financial sustainability. A co-op still needs to have a business. So I'm interested in shared decision-making power, but I think it's important to clarify that it's just a decision-making structure around governance and roles. It's not um, a co-op, you know, still needs to have a business. So the real problem in the U.S. is what I'm saying, which we all know, that we are not valuing public goods all the way from healthcare to education to the arts. These basic social goods are not being supported and they do not need to have a market. They don't need to be uh, sold privately. Demand can come from the government. You know, that's like the call for a new deal. You can actually create jobs through the government. And so the thing that I think is most sustainable financially is to have multiple revenue streams, like speaking with my Capricorn hat on. I think it would be really helpful if everyone who is teaching in the alternative art school is open to sharing the way they survive. And I think, unfortunately, because the larger structure doesn't allow us to have public subsidies for the things that we do that are so important for creative expression, like you're talking about, um, whereas in other countries, you can get a 10-year grant to make public art. This is important to remember. Um, because of that, we are going to have to have tons of revenue streams, you know, like diversified revenue streams. So, for example, I'm a teacher. I also do research and get paid to make reports for places like Grant Makers in the Arts, the Center for Cultural Innovation, and I also get paid to do public art projects every now and then that don't make that much money. And so this uh, range of things allows me to survive in the arts in this economic present, in this context. And I hope that more and more artists yep. will be transparent about how they get health care, how they're able to pay rent, put food on the table, care for their family. Um, and the real complexity is in historical contradictions that you rub up against when you're trying to survive in a country that doesn't value social goods. I don't think there's a magical silver bullet. Um, I think that, for example, that's why I'm convening so many um, technologists, venture capitalists, and business model experts to think about models for the future, for the institutions we want. And all of them say there has to be a variety of revenue streams because any one of them could be volatile. That's what we're seeing in this moment. Um, yeah, so not a great answer probably, but it's the reality of our political economy. How are artists making ends meet? Yes. Yeah, you know, actually in that book, I don't know if I put it in the website, but in this book, with onomatopoeia that is about how I manage and mediate public art projects. At the end, um, I have a, my whole budget, like how I survived the past 10 years, I put it in here. So you can uh, probably download it on the internet, but I made sure to put that in because I think it's really important to be transparent about, um, you know, class and privilege and realities about surviving here i called it the timeline of my material conditions and it goes all the way and you can see how much money i made and how much rent i paid and who mentored me and who my collaborators were all of that i'm Did pretty sure that it's on the website no? if you download the last uh, i'm not gonna ask pdf yeah if it's not i'll just put it up soon but you can also i'm open to people emailing me and asking this. Yeah, it's not a pretty picture in this country, but it's not designed to be. You know, why would we want radical visionaries? I don't think it's actually designed. One last question. Love you, Yang. <laughs> um, yeah, what else? 
tell everyone they invited to eat together event with um even caroline too so there's an eat together event that you're all invited to go to um would you mind putting the link in oh i guess people will know that's it caroline i guess you can um i collected all the links and we'll um post on the discussion board to look for your links on the discussion board and i think with that i think we're a wrap totally yeah thank you and let's keep talking smash cut dj i love it where well, we have so much to talk about that's what i'm gonna do for us one second so I wanna do it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.